Sanmanani de Milan, good evening and welcome to episode 289 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzaman Dongwa Kumalo. It's a Thursday edition of the Private Property Podcast. And if you're joining us for the first time, welcome to it. This is a pre-recorded interview that I'm having with our guest this evening. And this evening we're going to be looking at what are the laws and procedures regarding residential evictions. But before we get to it, of course, if you are joining us for the first time, make sure that you go to our Facebook and our YouTube pages to catch up on all the great content that we've already brought to your screens. And to all our regular viewers, welcome back. You know how we do it. Every single weekday, you and I have an appointment at 7 p.m. where I tackle a hot property topic with an expert guest who helps us navigate our property journey. Doesn't matter where you are in the property value chain or certainly where you are in your property journey, this is a show that helps you along the way. It's the first of July the second half of the year. I want to find out from you what are your property goals for the rest of the year and how have your property goals from the beginning of the year uh, been so far? Because I think this is now a good time to reflect on what has worked in the first half of the year, what what hasn't worked, what you did right, what you didn't do right, and of course how you can better uh, certainly some of your systems and habits to make sure that you make your property dreams come true. Well, to get us start with our conversation this evening. I'm joined by somebody who hasn't been on the show before. And before I introduce him, of course, you can look forward to other shows across Private Property's social media pages. I am talking about the farming podcast as it is a Thursday that you can catch later on this evening with award-winning farmer Umba Linwogo. And that comes to your screens every Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if you've got an interest in farming agriculture, then that certainly is the show that you want to tune into. And every Mondays and Fridays, Chad takes us through amazing properties that you can find on www.privateproperty.com and of course gives us a good taste of what we can expect uh, in the property market. And on Wednesdays, ST Classen brings you the first time home buyers show, which is always in conversation with people who've walked that property journey and have gone on to grow their property portfolio from strength to strength. So if you want to get a sense of how they did it, then that certainly is a show for you to tune into. Those are the shows that you can look forward to every single weekday at 8 p.m. here on the private property social media Ages. Well, to get us started, as I want to, as I said earlier, I want to find out from you. It's the first of July. I want to hear from you. What are your property goals for the rest of the year? But also, what, how are you doing with the goals that you set for yourself uh, at the beginning of the year? Do share with us down here below. We're going to keep this conversation going on our social media pages, especially because this is a pre-recorded interview. Well, to help us better understand what the laws and procedures regarding uh, evictions, residential evictions, this evening I'm joined by Liad Harder, who's a director at Harder Incorporated. Uh, Liad, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Samad Tumba. It's so nice to see you and so nice to be here for the first time. It's, all, it's only such a pleasure. I think I, I already know that we're probably going to call uh, on your legal expertise in the future. So we're looking forward to having you back on the show already. And uh, I, I think, Liad, I, I think <laughs> Liad, let's actually just get into it because I, I, I'm in a number of for example, different, you know, WhatsApp groups where different landlords um, and even property investors are in and even on WhatsApp. I think one of the, the, the scary things that you tend to see across these groups, whether it's WhatsApp or, you know, Facebook, is that oftentimes, you know, landlord will, will, will tell on themselves around some of the essentially illegal things that they do where their tenants are concerned. Uh, and it often comes when, of course, uh, maybe a tenant hasn't been paying rent for a number of, of months and what a landlord does in order to get that tenant out. And I can already tell you now, it's all kinds of illegal activity. And, and, and I want us to get into then, how do we go about um, evicting and, and uh, you know, tenants but before we even get to eviction laws and procedures, let's look at what happens prior to getting to that stage. Because I think, you know, an eviction is almost at the late stage of, of, of a, you know, residential dispute, I'd say that, where your tenant hasn't, you know, been paying. Um, but obviously we want to, as much as possible, curb it prior to that. Um, we don't want to, to have to get to evictions, especially uh, during this period. So w- what would typically happen, Liad, in the event where 
your tenants, especially today, it's the 1st of July. So a lot of landlords are expecting that uh, rental payment from their tenants and their tenants, when close of business comes, they still haven't paid rent today. What should a landlord do as far as you know the law and what is legally permissible uh, is concerned? Okay, um, well, you've raised a few very uh, relative and important questions, uh, so relevant questions and points, because uh, I've seen those comments on Facebook uh, landlord groups or property owner groups, and uh, we'll have to deal with those just now. I think the first question that's most pertinent is today is the first of the month, it's the first of July. Um, can't believe it is, but it is. And the question is, my tenant's supposed to pay today, right? Obviously, in terms of the lease agreement, generally speaking, the, te- the rental is due on or before the first day of the month, right? You pay it in, in advance for the month, effectively. Mm-hmm. Now, today passes and I don't see the payment in my bank account, um, the alarm bells go off, right? Everyone starts worrying, uh, even more so in these sensitive times which we live. But generally speaking, you expect the money in your bank account, that's the landlord's expectations. What happens uh, if it's not in there today is tomorrow morning, the landlord gets very upset, phones the tenant, perhaps enters into uh, some sort of verbal dispute or, or disagreement with them. It escalates very quickly, um, you know, emotions run high, and then um, the gloves are off. Uh, my first advice there is to avoid that situation altogether. I've written many articles on it. Um, by no means, and, and please don't um, misunderstand me, um, a tenant's attorney, I'm a landlord's attorney, but that being said, I also believe in fairness from both sides. I've written articles on that too. <laughs> I've written articles about everything we'll be speaking about because it's something that, that permeates with me and it enters my mind often in, in what I do. So for the last 11 years, I've been handling matters almost exclusively for landlords, once in a while for a tenant. What I can say, the, there's three crucial points that every landlord and tenant has to enter into when they consider the relationship between each other. Number one is respect. You have to respect each other's needs and desires. Number two is good communication. Uh, And number three is fairness. So I'll deal with all of them, but uh, when it comes to um, understanding each other and expectations, the landlord expects the tenant to pay up front. The tenant expects to be in the premises, right? So long as they both comply with the lease agreement, uh, there shouldn't be any issues, but life happens to everyone, to tenants, to landlords, and what we need to then move on to is, is respecting each other, understanding each other's position, and communicating openly, transparently, and fairly. So what that means is, if I'm a tenant and I cannot pay you on the first day of the month for whatever reason, and, and right now it's most relevant is someone, heaven forbid, has lost their job, the first thing they should do as a tenant is phone the landlord and say, landlord, I've just lost my job. Um, I've got savings, so I'll be able to pay you this month, for, for example. Um, but next month I'm in trouble. I don't have any income. That open communication, that transparent communication goes a long way as a tenant to at least speak to the landlord and get their expectations right. So the worst thing you can do as a tenant in my mind is not communicate, put your head in the sand and hope for the best. Landlords then have an opportunity at least, at the very least, to consider the tenant's position and say, thank you, Mr. Tenant or Mrs. Tenant, for letting me know about your position. I appreciate that you'll be using your savings to pay this month's rental. And next month, bearing in mind that you are not earning an income, we need to make a decision together as a team um, as to how we'll approach the situation. It may be that the landlord asks the tenant, and I don't think it would be so unreasonable, to move out and, and, and move into a family member for argument's sake, as opposed to staying in a premises which they cannot could no longer afford. The alternative to that, of course, is to discuss a payment plan, saying, okay, look, you're not going to be employed for the next month, mm-hmm. maybe three months, we're not sure. Let's work on something. You know, let's maybe reduce the rental by a little bit, but you're, you're clawed back, which just means you'll pay it back over time. There, there's so many different options available to landlords and tenants, but it all goes back to the three points I mentioned earlier. You've got to communicate early, you've got to communicate openly, transparently, and you have to respect and be fair to each other. Mm. And and I think, you know, one of the things, Leah, that I actually want us to explore a bit later on is what active steps can a tenant, uh, you know, take? And you've already started pointing out what a tenant could potentially do, especially where they see that they're not going to be able to make rent. And more often than not, 
we probably aren't able to make rent, not on the first. You already know probably a week before the first, um, especially if it's something related to work or losing your job. And in the event where there's you know, a big financial uh, responsibility that came on from when you got paid, let's say, for example, you got paid on the 20th or the 25th and something financially really big came, perhaps an emergency. And these things happen. You know, as the art points out, that life does happen. And you know that you need to dip into what would typically be allocated as your rental money. As soon as that decision is, you know, is made and that payment is made, uh, it is important for a tenant to then communicate with their landlord as soon as possible, as opposed to waiting for the first to come and go and waiting for the landlord to then contact them. But we're going to deal with that later on um, in our conversation there. I want us to, to, to still stay on then what landlords can and cannot do. And let's first start with what they can't do, because I think this is one of those things, as you said, you've also seen these comments in a lot of these groups um, and, and, and different landlords are, are sharing, unfortunately, some of the illegal things that they're doing in order to deal with uh, non-paying tenants. What are some of the things that we absolutely cannot do as landlords? They're illegal. And, and really, I think if anything, if tenants had the, the legal muscle and even the financial means, they could probably take that particular landlord to task. All right, um, as I'm into, what I'll tell you is um, an anecdote, right? I speak in anecdotes often, funny enough, but um, so you'll forgive me, hopefully, and you'll solve your viewers. Um, we, we put up a post on a, an advert on our social media page, you know, Hadar Incorporated, Property Law Specialist. We put it on, and uh, our social media partners then went on and advertised it, so it reaches uh, a lot more people and many more landlords in, in South Africa. And the results were, were very interesting. Uh, number one, not one landlord called to ask for help, but all that happened is as a result of the advert, it became a bit of, it actually unfortunately fueled uh, the unhappy landlord side of things. And all these different landlords, or they said they were landlords or property owners, went onto the, um, the post and started commenting about the different ways that they handle their unruly tenants. So immediately and off the bat, there was a disrespect for the tenants. Now, I understand that these landlords in particular had been burnt in the past, potentially by bad tenants, by bad people, because I believe good people make a plan, uh, and I'll deal with that a bit later. Um, but let's call it tenants who took chances and, and took advantage of the landlord. So I understand where they were coming from, but this thing escalated very quickly into advice on, from uh, employing tattooed bikers to uh, taking the doors off for what they call maintenance. I mean, it's, it's very common. Everything I'm saying to you, you would have heard before, you would have read yeah. before. Yeah. It, it's, it repeats itself. But for me, the anecdote is, you know, we put up a post on how approach property law specialists, and the next thing, the comments are all about taking unlawful steps. So to answer your question simply, what can you not do as a landlord? You cannot unlawfully evict a tenant. We've got the Rental Housing Act, which regulates the relationship between the landlord and tenant. And, and I must say, even though I'm a landlord's attorney and I am biased toward landlords, there are certain provisions in that act which protect the interest of justice, number one, and number two, fairness, because there are opportunities and situations where landlords and tenants should be speaking as opposed to defaulting straight away to the aggressive side of things. Um, I'm not saying it's uh, after six months, you can still have as much patience. I'm saying there's, there's a time and place for discussions and, and being fair to each other. So number one, you cannot unlawfully evict anyone. In fact, in terms of the Rental Housing Act, and it's a criminal offence. Um, so you, you need to be very careful. Uh, in fact, you should never do it. I mean, let's be honest, it should never happen to anyone, no matter how frustrated you are, because there, there's a reason for the law and there's a reason why we have to follow it. And again, I don't want to sound uh, unsympathetic to the landlord. I am landlord biased, but I'm also biased towards fairness, more biased towards fairness. Um, you cannot remove doors. You cannot cut electricity. Uh, it's called the spoliation of the tenant's rights in terms of a lease agreement or otherwise. In fact, you don't even have to have a valid lease agreement at that point, but I'm not going to go into an academic and, and technical argument or, or discussion. Yeah, I, I want to talk practically um, from, from the ground and from my experience with landlords and tenants. Uh, you cannot mistreat a tenant, you cannot intimidate them, you cannot harass them. Uh, I can list off maybe another 25 things, but we all know the major ones are unlawfully evicting, uh, spoliating them by uh, you know, not allowing them into the premises, by cutting the electricity or water supply, um, and certainly no harassment and intimidation. 
Mm. And and I think, you know, Leah, those are so important to note, especially because everything that you've listed there, I've seen people in, in, in different landlords groups saying that they've done those things and were essentially successful in uh, getting rid of, and I say getting rid of because that's the language that they use uh, of their tenants from their premises. And it's just so important as, ten- as landlords to rather make sure that you put in the right um, provisions, have the right systems in place to deal with non-paying tenants, as opposed to resorting to illegal activity. Because as Leah points out, um, you know, it is a criminal offense. And I think the, the unfortunate thing is more often than not, tenants typically wouldn't know how to um, go about whether, you know, opening a case against their landlord in the event where, you know, something like that is done. And I think that's probably the only, I'll say, saving grace for those particular landlords. I want to find out from you at home as we kickstart the 1st of July in the second half of the year, how your property goals are going. I think you know, earlier on in the year, I asked you what your property goals for 2021 were how are you in achieving your property goals for the year ahead and also what are your goals for the remainder uh, of 2021 we've had six months to you know, adjust to this different way of living which has really become our norm and also adjust some of our goals and expectations especially where our property journey is concerned so what how have you readjusted some of your goals uh, when it comes to all things relating to property now Liad, i think we, we've we've looked at what landlords should avoid doing uh, and not even avoid what they should not do because it's not legal for them to do so. What can they then do in the event where uh, they're dealing with a tenant who is a non-paying tenant uh, and it may have been that they moved in, were able to pay, uh, let's say it's a a 12-month lease, they were able to pay the first two months or three months and then start defaulting on their rental. Um, What should be the thing that you do as of tomorrow in the event where, for example, you haven't uh, received your, your rent. And this is let's assume it's the first month, because as you're saying, I think not many people are going to wait until month six. And if anything, you shouldn't be waiting until month six without communicating um, with your tenants. So what are um, the, the, the things that landlords can do that are within the legal parameters? Okay, so number one, communicate. And communication doesn't just mean legal process, but... First and foremost, send a letter of demand. There's templates out there which are freely available to anyone. I don't particularly advocate for someone to go to an attorney and spend 450 rand on a letter of demand. I think it's unnecessary. But I do believe there's a time and place for it. So number one, if you don't know, if you're unsure of your terms of your lease and you need a professional to help you, go to an attorney. That's fine. But if you can do it yourself and you can ensure proper compliance with your lease agreement, send a letter of demand out on the very second day after rental was due. So the second calendar day, generally speaking, in terms of all lease agreements. Uh, I'm obviously talking about residential leases today in particular. Um, we service uh, you know, clients from the biggest REITs to the smallest single property owners, but the principle is always the same. Is on the second day after rental is due, I would send a letter of demand out. Now, with regards to good communication, it doesn't just mean send the letter out and hope for the best. It means send the letter out and then phone the tenant. And phone the tenant to have an honest um, conversation that's not aggressive. It doesn't need to be. It can just be matter of fact. It doesn't need to be overly sympathetic. It doesn't need to be overly cold. It can be a matter of fact. You are in arrears. I'm concerned about my rights as a landlord. I had to send the letter of demand out because I have to protect my interests. If you pay within seven days, depending on the lease, of course, or within 20 business days, if it's a residential lease, all depending on the wording, I will not issue a summons against you and I will not cancel your lease. So please remedy your breach. I find that that tone is the fairest way to go. I'm sure there'll be many naysayers, especially the ones who commented on our advert, who say that letter demands are worth the paper it's written on and it'll be uh, used for fire or whatever the case may be. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just saying that's fine. But make sure you follow your processes, your legal processes. You may want to go an unlawful route. You may be itching to do it. That's up to you. I don't advocate for it. I don't believe in it. I believe it can get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, You said something very interesting uh, earlier as a Mantugwa, where where you said that um, it it takes that to to the landlord's benefit. Uh, A lot of tenants don't know their legal rights and can't afford to go to lawyers. What if your tenant is the one that manages to get the legal help or, or go to legal aid and, and then actually pursue you for what you've done uh, unlawfully to him or her? Um, so you need to be very careful. And that's why, as a default, say, 
follow your lease agreement. Thereafter, communicate. You'll find out very quickly whether you're dealing with a reasonable tenant or not. So I'll give you two examples, reasonable and unreasonable. Reasonable tenant says, Mr. Landlord or Mrs. Landlord, I'm so sorry. Uh, I actually did pay. It hasn't cleared yet. Or um, Mr. or Mrs. Landlord, uh, I'm so sorry. I don't have the money right now. Within the next two to three days, it'll be there. Right? That's reasonable. Unreasonable tenant doesn't answer the phone, ignores the letter of demand, or takes the call and is rude uh, or says to you, it's too bad, you're a landlord, you're wealthy, you know, you like the banks, you know, all these misconceptions that people have about landlords, and uh, go, go ahead and sue me because I know how long it takes. I know it's impossible to get a residential eviction. All the misconceptions that everyone believes in if they don't know what they're doing, legally speaking. So my advice is send a letter of demand out immediately. Mm. And and I think, Leah, let's deal then with what the next steps would be in the event where you're dealing with an unreasonable tenant. Because I think this obviously is, is particularly applicable to landlords who find themselves having those unreasonable tenants. Because as you say, with the majority of, of tenants, nobody wants to not pay their rent. Nobody's looking to you know stay in a place. Certainly nobody wants to be harassed by their landlord, whether it is via text or WhatsApps or calls or letters of demand. And more often than not in these situations, as you've pointed out, it is that there's something that's happened. I mean, I've had instances where um, you know, one of my tenants, there was a month where something had happened with their bank account. I think that some fraudulent activity had happened and their bank were alerted uh, he alerted his bank about the matter and they were dealing with it and they weren't going to fully resolve it before um, rent was due. And he already just told me sort of the previous month around probably like the 27th, 28th, that listen, I, I had been having this issue with my bank account. Um, rent is going to be three days late. They've given me like a, you know, a we're going to resolve this this by X time. And so I knew not to, uh, you know, worry that he's suddenly not paying rent um, for some other reason. So things like that become so important because tenants also do play an active role in uh, sometimes communicating. I think that's a big thing for tenants. In the event where you find yourself where life happens, especially right now, be proactive. And if you're just sending that WhatsApp, communicate with your landlord. Try to get it on text as much as possible as opposed to, you know, on phone call. Um, I prefer once, you know, my tenant has called or I call them, you put it on email just so we both also have a record of the conversation that we've had. And we're both on the same page about whatever agreement um, we come to. So I think that's an important thing for tenants that you can take that um active step in the event where you can see something has happened, you're not going to make rent and you don't want to create any, you know, unease when it comes to your relationship with your landlord. But Liad, then there are unfortunately unreasonable tenants, as you've said, those who are like, you'll sue me, you can try and evict me. I know how difficult um, evictions typically can be. Then what becomes the next step, uh, the next legal step that a landlord can take in the event where they're dealing with an unreasonable tenant? Okay, so, so number one, I just want to just give you another story. Um, people often ask me how I sleep at night, bearing in mind that we're eviction specialists, right? And, uh, and I said, look, but for the stress of COVID and everything else and running a firm with, you know, a number of people in our team and worrying about everyone's health and happiness, uh, I sleep quite well at night on, on, on an ethical, moral level because, I, and I mean this hand on heart, we've never evicted a, a good, honest person. And, and I'll explain to you why. Good, honest tenants speak to you. They make plans. They make arrangements. It may not be a payment arrangement. I understand it. If a landlord came to me tomorrow and said, my tenants have just told me they've lost their job, they cannot pay, I'd say, and I know it's, it's painful, give them a month to leave and find alternative accommodation. Let them sort out the money later on. The reason I say that is once you go legal, and, and yes, we will get you the eviction order, it's going to cost you quite an amount of money, especially if you're in the lower end of uh, salary, uh, uh, sorry, uh, rental um, with your regards to a tenant, if they're in the lower LSM, you, you need to be very mindful of legal costs. So if you apply your mind, and again, this goes contrary to uh, law firms' businesses, I'm giving advice to avoid law, uh, legal costs and law firms, mm -hmm. but I, I mean it practically. If you're able to give a reasonable tenant a month to find alternative accommodation, and they have an agreement that they will leave, and later on sort out their arrears, you're in the best place best place position as a landlord. Because the alternative is to fight, go to court, rental housing tribunals, it, it rolls into a number of months, one month becomes two, becomes three. You'll get your eviction order, it'll come at a cost. So 
again, to, to, to just talk about reasonable tenants, we genuinely, I do not believe in, in the many evictions we've done over the last 11 years, we've evicted a reasonable person. We've made so many good arrangements between parties. Neither have been happy, which is uh, the old cliche, is a good settlement is that neither party's happy. But it's much better than going all the way through the legal process. So I encourage that discussion that you said earlier with the tenant who said, I've got this issue, how do we resolve it? Even more so, actually, in your, in your scenario, what I would say to that reasonable tenant about uh, the issue with the bank is just provide proof. You know, it's one thing telling a story, just substantiate it. Send the uh, you know, communication between the bank and yourself to your landlord and say, here it is, here's the proof. As a reasonable landlord, you should then accept it because you've seen the proof of it, and then you'd be a bit more patient. So now to move on to the unreasonable tenants, um, the next legal steps, obviously, once the letter of demand is fired, is, and that's 20 business days generally in, in respect of a um, residential premises because of the CPA, Consumer Protection Act, you can then cancel a lease. That's the next letter you need to send out. Again, I'll, I'll repeat my advice. Try avoid legal fees if you can, but not at the cost of doing it improperly or, or, or in, in a way that's going to harm your legal process. So if you can do it, if there is a template that you've got that you know is correct, send that cancellation out. Uh, generally speaking, what that cancellation says is you receive notice on X date, you fail to remedy your breach within 20 business days, I hereby give you notice of cancellation of your lease agreement. That's the next step in the legal process. Mm. And, and I think the unfortunate thing, as, as you're saying, Liat, is we do get the unreasonable tenants and often they also know that a lot of landlords don't have the financial muscle to afford legal fees uh, that comes with an eviction order in the eviction process. So some of them count on that uh, in particular. So I think as landlords, it, it also just does go to when you were vetting your tenant in the beginning, how well were you vetting your tenant? Did you verify, for example, from whether their previous landlord, did you get a sense of their payment pattern? I think those are some of the things that you're supposed to do, some of the due diligence that you should do from the onset so that you know that you trust your, your quality control um, you know, system. And in the event where that gets right, then you're unlikely to get you know, a bad tenant or an unreasonable tenant. I think if anything, you may have one that is proactive as we keep pointing out. Now, you know, Leah, I want us to then look at what, firstly, let's just address the issue of cost, because I think this is one of those things that I know landlords, especially those who haven't um, had an eviction process before, thankfully, because I think no landlord wants to go through that, no tenant wants to go through that either. Um, what kinds of costs are we looking at in the event where you now know that you're sitting with an unreasonable tenant and uh, you want to take legal steps to remove them from your property. Okay, so um, firstly, I want to like the old school cliche attorneys, and, and I'm a new age attorney, but they always say, how long is a piece of street, right? And that's yeah. the answer. Yep. I mean, yep. that, that's a wonderful uh, you know, kind of answer that teaches, not even in law school, but in articles. That's how you answer a client. I don't agree with that. I think you've got to be a bit more robust in this day and age as an attorney. Uh, and as a property uh, owner's partner, you've got to be upfront about it. We in our firm, and, and I don't know how every other firm works it, we've got a set fee structure. Um, and, and it's very easy. You can go to our website, www.hadarinc. It's H-A-D-A-R-I-N-C. That's here today. We've got options there for corporate clients and for individual clients. You can click on the private or individual clients, and there's infographics there, not only explaining the processes for you, but the commitment to costs for the entire process. Um, because I, I found personally as a, as a younger, I want to call 36 young, but a younger law firm owner in a more modern law firm, that the worst thing is the uncertainty with costs, right? Yes. I'll give you an example again. If you were flying uh, someone to, uh, to Cape Town, right, for, for work or, or actually for pleasure, let's, let's use wrong examples. Not now, obviously, but when it's safe to do so. Um, you get on the flight and they say, well, when you try to book, they say, don't worry about paying right now. Just get on the flight, enjoy the flight, and we'll speak when you land. So you get on the flight, you have a wonderful flight, and uh, you really enjoyed it, and it got you to where you wanted. So A to B, you get there, you land in Cape Town, they say, great, before you get off the plane, here's your bill. And you say, okay, you've got a certain expectation in your mind. A flight to Cape Town these days, 1,500 Rand, probably some good specials out there at the moment. Uh, you land, and they say to you, great, it's uh, 8,750 Rand. And, and your eyes almost pop out and you say, hang on a second, uh, I didn't agree to that, right? Mm -hmm. I, I never would have flown to Cape Town 
If you had told me it would have cost me 8,750 Rand to fly from A to B, I would have driven, I would have flown some other airline, whatever the case may be. So I, I always find the legal fees were, were similar to that example. You, you get to the end of it and you get these unexpected surprises by way of, of invoices. And the one thing we try to eradicate in this firm, and I think it's a, it's a good thing for most law firms to do, especially when it comes to something like an eviction application, which is you know what you're doing, you've built your processes for it. It's not rocket science, with all due respect to every property lawyer, myself included, and my team. Um, you know what to in for, you know how much time you need to spend on unopposed evictions. So we've got a set structure. Um, you can go look at it on the website. We commit to that fee. That is it. You know, it, it sets it out for you. Whether it takes us 25 phone calls to the sheriff to make sure he serves the eviction or one, you get charged the same. So you don't get um, disadvantage or, or prejudice by the fact that the sheriff's not doing his job and we have to chase him up and no disrespect to the sheriff. I'm just using that as an example. Um, mm-hmm. So there's a commitment to fees there. And, and I think that's, it should be the bare minimum when you're looking to evict someone, you commit, you, you, you get a law firm that commits to a fee, a fee structure, and then you know what to expect and you know how to budget accordingly for it. To mm-hmm. answer your question directly, there's a wide range of, uh, of firms out there that charge different amounts. There aren't that many specialists in, in eviction. So number one, my advice is to go to property law specialists. There are a number of them, but not every law firm. Number two, uh, once you've established they are experts and what they do, and they will be able to get you an eviction order, um, you, you can check out the different prices. And, you know, it's, it's like buying TVs. There's the cheapest one, there's the most expensive one, and it's one down the middle. You decide which one you want. You decide which one is, is within your budget, and, and you go with them. So the range would generally be for an unopposed eviction between, I would say, 15,000 rand to 35,000 rand. And I think that then gives us a great sense, certainly for viewers at home who didn't know how the the structure could typically be. So you've now got a good sense of the range. And I think if you want to um, certainly find out from uh, how to incorporate it, we have shared their website details down here below. So you can check out their their free structure um, that they that where you know what you're going to pay for in the beginning. I love the analogy that you used, Elia, around uh, when we get on a plane, we already know how much it is because we've paid for it, as opposed to being told when you get to your destination that actually this is the amount that you're going to pay. Before I wrap up with you, Leon, I think one last thing I want us to look at is, and you spoke about this, that more often than not, people are able to get into arrangements with their landlord in the event where they cannot make rent. And, and I'm thinking of it, especially now as we're in the middle of a third wave and we don't quite know what the economic effects of this third wave are going to be. I mean, we saw different kinds of payment plans uh, being made when we were in the early days of lockdown um, and even when we were you know, in the second wave. And, and I think the longer we are living in, in a COVID world, the more everybody's obviously frustrated, but also the more even landlords are like, look, this is now the way of life. Um, I was understanding in the beginning, I now don't have the financial capacity to be understanding. Because I think that's also the other side of the coin that in as much as in the early days, there were landlords who were saying you could, you know, will you can stay one month free, for example, and they went to, you know, made all kinds of arrangements with tenants who weren't able to make their payments. Perhaps share with us some of the different kinds of arrangements uh, a landlord and a tenant can make uh, just to give both parties uh, you know, some ideas on how they can try and meet each other halfway, um, especially in the event where the tenant still wants to stay in the place and they will be able to probably pay, let's say, in the next two months or in the next three months, as opposed to, for example, somebody who's lost their job and they're very uncertain about you know, where their next income is going to come from or how they're going to move forward. Okay, so um, there's a few ways of dealing with it. Number one, if it's the end of the road, right? So your tenant has been an unreasonable tenant throughout this process. And, and I don't mean unreasonable always um, in the way of they didn't uh, want to pay. Um, I'm talking about the guys who just outright refused. Um, those tenants, for me, you take legal action and you proceed. There's no discussion to be had there. A third wave only is kind of the final nail in the coffin for, for those bad tenants that strung you along for a while. The reasonable tenants who have potentially now hit cash flow problems or lost their jobs, which is, which is obviously a terrible thing, and, and I'm so sympathetic towards it, even as a landlord's attorney, I believe you should chat about it. I think that they've got to look at their savings if they've got any. 
Uh, because the roof over your head is the most important thing right now, right? Now, there's also that misconception the landlord is like a bank, you know, but it's no different for me walking into Woolworths, taking a trolley full of goods, walking out, and when security stop, you say, what you're doing? You say, well, hang on, Woolworths have so much money. Um, what's the difference to that? People have a misconception and landlords are like that. And I'm talking from the biggest REITs, you know, who, who may have uh, larger cash supplies, but they've got shareholders uh, to account to, to the smallest one man, uh, one property uh, sole owners who, who don't one have... Woman, one, one woman, one property. One, one woman, sorry, forget one yeah. man. More importantly, one woman uh, yeah. property owners. Um, so... You've got to understand their point of view and, and say this landlord is, does not have unlimited cash supplies. The bank's knocking um, on his or her door and they need to pay their, their bonds and whatever other expenses they have. So at that point, you sit down and, and hopefully uh, safely across the table or, or virtually or just speak on the phone and the tenant then says, okay, I've got certain savings. I don't want to deplete all of them, but let me tap into it and, and let me give you something uh, as a reasonable tenant, to buy myself some more time, right? I think that's the best case scenario for everyone. L let's even discuss a reduced number that at least covers majority of the landlords out of pocket disbursements. It's one thing, you know, not profiting of, of, your, of your rent, which not all landlords do, but definitely not being out of pocket and potentially losing your property. That's unacceptable for any landlord, and I don't think any tenant can expect that of their landlord. So number one is to discuss it openly, um, transparently, and honestly, I know it's, it's, it's very um, daunting, but share your private information with the landlord. Show them how much money you have in reserve. A lot of people keep their, their cards close to their chest and try to get an advantage as a tenant when they've got 50,000 rand in the bank. That's not fair. If my rental 7,000 rand a month, I can't afford it because I've lost my job, but I've got 50,000 rand worth of savings, surely I should be tapping into that as a reasonable tenant and, and making a plan. Maybe I can't pay the full amount because I am worried about my future, but something. Make that 5,000 rand out of 7,000 and then build up a little bit of, a, of an additional amount which you'll pay off of, uh, you know, over a number of months. That, for me, is reasonableness. Uh, and that's what I encourage landlords and tenants to do together. Mm. Liad, as we wrap up this evening, I see that we are running slightly out of time. I want to find out from you last tip, particularly for landlords, because I think they're the ones who often uh, want to find, they call it creative ways of, of dealing with uh, you know, non-paying tenant, but the reality is it's illegal ways of dealing with a non-paying tenant. Final tips for landlords when it comes to dealing with you know, um, non-paying tenants, and also a final tip for tenants in terms of uh, dealing with a landlord who's using illegal means to, to evict them from their property. Okay, I'll start with the tenant side first because I am landlord biased, but I am, as I said earlier, interest of justice more biased, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so as a tenant, if you are being um, treated unreasonably or unlawfully, go to the rental housing tribunal, lodge a complaint there. Uh, it's not fair. I mean, I understand landlords, as I say, I sympathize with them much more because that's what I, that's the side of the table I'm on, really. But I don't want to act for any unreasonable landlord who just takes off doors and, and unlawfully evicts people, especially, um, you know, the, the particular people are supposed to be protected by the Pi Act. So those kind of uh, vulnerable individuals, women-headed households, disabled people, the elderly, um, families with, with minors, go to the rental housing tribunal urgently, get some advice there, lodge a complaint, uh, open a case there, number one. Uh, if you're being harassed, intimidated, or anything unlawful that you shouldn't be feeling, regardless of the fact that you cannot pay your rent for one month or two, you can go to the police station and lay criminal charges of harassment and intimidation. Now, that's the, as much advice you'll get from me for tenants ever. Um, now, moving to landlords. Um, landlords, I, and you said something so, so relevant earlier, uh, Zamantugwa, which is about vetting. Vetting for me, we can use, we, we need another half an hour to speak about vetting, but vet your tenants properly. I spoke to one of my major REIT clients this week and we, we spoke about strategically how we're going to move forward as they grow probably the biggest uh, residential uh, fund in the country. And, and we spoke about the strength of, of vetting. They actually told me that they recently have rejected so many applications because off the bat, they could see that those tenants couldn't afford the rental. Now, they're actually being fair to both, and it's a horrible feeling being rejected, but they're being fair to both parties because as a tenant, you put yourself under pressure if you financially cannot afford that rental currently, 
and you hope that things change. And as a landlord, you're going to suffer in two or three months' time when they get into arrears immediately almost, you know. So vetting is huge. I, I urge you to vet. So prevention is better than cure. Vetting is huge. You can read articles that I've written and others have written about it. Uh, we can discuss it potentially next time. My number one tip is vet. Number two tip is communicate quickly, swiftly. On the first day after rental is due, send that letter out. It's not an act of war. It's good process. It's good business practice to send a letter to demand. And then immediately call the tenant and say, right, letters there. You've got seven days in terms of if I'm going to issue summons against you or 20 business days before I cancel. Let's talk. Let's force the issue. Let's be reasonable with each other. Let's be fair. And let's conclude an, an arrangement. Yeah. Leah, that's a great place to leave it at. I'm already going to promise uh, our viewers that we're going to bring you back to explore vetting and best practices for vetting tenants, because I think it is one of those things that landlords sometimes typically tend to struggle with or don't have a system in place to make sure that they get quality tenants. Leah, it was so great to have you at the show. I know we're going to be having you back. We're definitely uh, bringing you back to talk all things vetting. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. And that is Liat Harder, who's a director at Harder Incorporated. And if you want to get in touch with them, we have shared their contact details down here below. And that brings us to the end of this Thursday edition of the Private Property Podcast. I've been your host, Zamantu Mwakumalo. It's a Thursday, so at 8 p.m., you can look forward to award-winning farmer Mbalinuoko on the Farming Podcast. Until then, hoping you're staying home and staying safe.